Hi, this is Ryan, Better Tattooing. Gonna do another one. <laughs> so today we're gonna be going a little bit more over the basics of stencil placement, mapping the body. We're gonna go after the upper arm. All right. All right, now that's over with. Mapping the upper arm. So our last video was about a basic intro and, and the forearm, which I usually find is the most difficult to try and explain to people. That's why we just tackled it first with no sleep, which, yeah. That's when you're a professional tattooer, question mark. It's gatekeeped all hell. When you work like 20 hour days, seven days a week. This is just stupid. Just ignore people if they say that. Even me. Just be like, shut up, Ryan. It's fine. Uh, anyways, so upper arms. Upper arms are really neat. We'll just do our little arm graph here about shoulder tricep line bicep into the elbow right and i don't like segmenting the body this much but there is very unique stresses that we're going to apply to each one of these realistically if you're doing you know a sleeve you want to take into account the forearm but we cover that in another video so i'm not doing it today <clears throat> upper arm is really unique remember we have a rotational compressive and stretching right Torsional stuff that's going to be going on, the like, compressed fucking sheer stuff. It's not physics. Well, I mean, it kind of. I guess it is physics, but I I, I couldn't do physics today. That's going to be a Wednesday thing. Um, these these stresses are going to apply everywhere on the body, right? And the upper arm is no different. The biggest thing we need to try and understand on this one, and I really, really want to push this one probably first. Top og. Man, I'm having a bad day spelling. Is the topography right? We want to see the spots that are high and low, the spots that are going to influence people's viewability at different angles, the front, the back, the inside, the outside, and what spots are going to be closest and which ones are going to be furthest away, right? And uh, depending on how yoked, I guess, the individual is when we're looking at the upper arm, the topography is going to be really drastic, right? We have a spot on the tricep and then the outer head of the deltoid that are always going to be there in someone's face but they experience really, really, really unique stresses, right? And they're going to be bisected. There's almost like, you can cut this into to quadrants, right? There's going to be quartile aspects just when you're creating a design that make it really, really, really complex. Um, and I'm probably going to overdo this, so just bear with me, but this is how my brain works when I'm attaching this stuff, or attacking this stuff anyways, right? When we have the topography of the tricep, and the deltoid and we'll just we'll start with the tricep because it's just this weird meaty like when you look at it folded out it's like this horseshoe shaped muscle you know it looks like a liver um, and as it flexes it contracts quite a bit and it can pull a ton of skin up and down depending on where the arm is in motion and how built the person is right oh yoked um, so when we're looking at these things we're trying to figure out especially when we're doing like the initial mapping of the design. If there is increased topography in this area of the body especially, can we utilize it as a foreground element? Because it's already out there so far, you know? And it's got so much, so much distance closer to the person's face and so much movement. We automatically know that we can't put anything rigid, right? This has to be an organic uh, shape or aspect of the design is something that has movement that can, it's not straight, right? It's just not rigid, it's organic. Because if we put something like a square, right? You have a horseshoe shaped thing and you put something that is literally square through it and this thing is bending and contracting, this thing is gonna get all wacky, it's just gonna be gross. So we don't do it, right? Plus at the same time, these aspects, especially somebody who is super built, as they age, muscles deteriorate, and then that, that thing that you may be utilizing to really grasp a viewer's attention isn't gonna be as strong, you know, 15 years down the road. Maybe some people, I don't know, look at Sylvester Stallone, ooh, yucky. Um, which would be good for him, no, no shaming, whatever. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna pick stuff out like this. If it's really strong and it's really defined, we wanna make sure that we're gonna be putting organic shapes over top of it. If somebody isn't, they're just rake thin, super simple body type, you know, like those, those uh, heroin chic ads from the 90s or something like that, right? <clears throat> you can choose to, if you want, not utilize that depth and the topography to try and build, you know, a more gripping image that somebody has to look at. Um, or it has to engage at a very specific angle only using organic shapes. Maybe you can use something else, right? Maybe you can use more rigid designs or placement of these things. But that 
pull, right? That compressive aspect and that stretching that's gonna occur, especially when you bend your elbow up, is still gonna be really evident there. So you have to try to mitigate that when you're thinking about the design, right? Always start with the tricep. That's just kind of my thing. If you're gonna go with the upper arm and mapping the whole thing out, just start there. See how that moves. When you see somebody walking around, really pay attention, attention to the topography. Have them flex, bend, move. See all the different ways that goes. Uh, depending on what they're doing, right? And then try to think about how that's gonna influence your design. We wouldn't put something that's super round on top of a tricep because it's gonna distort regardless of the person, right? Things that are moving forward, directing through the image. You hear a lot of that 3D figure eight, right? Where you're leading down and through the design and things are coming back around. You just create more levels. The Guy Aitchison's really famous for this one, which works really well on the upper arm and other places on the body as well, but it's kind of a cheat way of trying to make sure that you have flow inside the design. It doesn't work if your design isn't actually built to have you know, less movement. Like if you're doing bioorganic or biomechanical stuff, like this is the easiest way to make sure that something's gonna fit the body. You don't even have to think about it, right? You're just using the general body positioning type style, like just our genetics, this, this is the species. Like that's how you're built to build the design. But if you're not doing an organic design, you can overdo it quite a bit, trying to focus on those foreground and background elements. People are jerks around here. And you're gonna just like overload and occlude the image where it's not going to look as clean and as it could, right? So don't, don't utilize things that are made for a specific style unless you're doing that specific style, right? If you're trying to do something that's trash polka, you, you know, you wouldn't put a whole bunch of whatever in it, I don't know. Trash polka, you can do anything. This is a bad example. Like I said, I'm tired, I'm sorry. Um, so anyways, that's the topography, right? We get into the shoulder, erase this so you can see it maybe a little bit better because I did draw that awfully small. Shoulders got three sections, right? Inner, outer, front. We get the front, outer, back, deltoid. This is really unique with these aspects or this part of the body anyways, right? Because at the top part of it, we get a ton of compressive stress. Oh, I did see it, didn't I? Okay. If you lift your arm, it moves together. It also has spacing and gapping that'll occur on here. And same thing, if you bend and flex your arm, rotate things like this, you'll actually have a tiny bit of rotation that's gonna take place on this as well, right? But it's not gonna be very much, which is kinda cool. I'm gonna put a plus there. So when you're, when you're doing this, once again, we have to look at the musculature of the individual. The more built the individual, the more you know, thin that they are, maybe the more heavy that they are. Maybe the skin is a little bit softer, maybe it's a little bit older. We wanna pay attention to those movements because when we put something on here, the, the idea is to take something that's round on the body and place a round design on it, right? <clears throat> But if you know that certain parts of the design are going to be compressed or able to be rotated, it's pretty easy that, you know, your design can slowly turn into an oblong shape that isn't going to be holding that very specific, like, circular pattern that you may require to have that tattoo be legible and understood at the distance. So if you understand how these things are going to be, you know, distorting, Pretty simple, you can design your tattoo to fit inside those specs. What I'll do is I'll just grab a pen on a person, I'll make a circle. I'll tell them to bend and move, right? I wanna see how that thing distorts. If it stays static, no matter what they do, except for maybe the top end gets a little bit compressed and they get above a 90 angle on their hand or their arm, raising it above their head, boss, you know, you can utilize something like this. But that's also on a 2D plane, so we wanna make sure that we're looking at it from every angle, right? We're gonna look at it from the front, the side, the back, and we're gonna see how much taper that this has, right? <clears throat> a lot of people will put portraits or something on the outside of the shoulder, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. What happens is we draw a face, right? And on a two-dimensional space, it looks great. What happens if this is on a piece of paper, right? and we take that paper and we bend it. What happens then? The face bends with it. If we take something like a flat two dimensional representation of a picture and we bend it over a concave surface, it'll foreshorten the face, lengthen it, drop it back, and it can make it look really weird, right? So you gotta pay attention to that. If you have somebody who has very thin arms trying to do a very specific, very bold, you know, like highly detailed portrait is probably not the best idea because it's gonna warp too much, right? You wanna make sure it's a little bit broader and flatter and try to replicate that X, Y plane that you're doing your artwork on, especially if you're on a tablet, right? To make sure that it fits. And you can't, you can't utilize 
digital platforms to try and recreate exactly what the effect is going to be. I mean, it's a good way to type, like guess a little bit, but everyone's body is different and their stresses are different. You can't just use one model to test how everything is going to fit. There's always going to be adaptation. So take the time with people when you're doing this to make sure that you're actually looking at their body and how it moves, right? Next aspect, something we're going to look at, kind of almost done with topography, is the inner arm. The inner arm is really cool, right? It's flat. Super cool. We get one main line that's going to run through it that separates the bicep from the edge of the tricep coming down, and we get into the armpit, right? Which no one likes getting their armpit tattooed. And same with the elbow down there. Um, really interesting aspect of this one too is we're going to get a lot of pulling, right? Stretching stress on the tricep side, but we get compressive stress on the other. Flex your bicep and straight out. No compress, but resting. It's always relatively straight, right? Opposite with this one. When we bend our arm and flex it up, there's a lot of pull that's here. But resting, it usually stays pretty straight on the inside of the arm. So when we're placing designs, there used to be like, the, the big thing was like the words, right? They're running along the bicep line. <clears throat> you have to pay attention to that, right? Because in relation to that bicep line, where it's crossing over, if you go above it, you're gonna be increasing the compressive stresses that are gonna occur on the edges, especially towards the center of it. You'll get a bowing. Right? And if you stick a little bit lower, what you're actually going to do is start getting a pulling motion down and around the arm because of the shape of the tricep, where a lettering will trail and look crooked depending on where someone's arm is in relation to the mirror that they're looking at, or maybe the person that they're interacting with at a distance, right? So pretty simple for doing larger scale work and we're trying to map out something here. We want to ask two questions before we get into it. The first one is going to be, what do you want there? <laughs> Right? Simple. Dot Ryan. Um, I will do this. The other one is going to be how do you want to present it to the world, right? Do you want to have your arm relaxed and down? Or how's your natural way of showing something? Do you want to have your arm up? Have them do it four or five times. Like here, just raise your arm for me. If it keeps going to the same spot, that's where they're going to raise it to show people. And you can design the tattoo to be there, right? Because it's an intimate space in the body. Like you have to literally open up and show someone to get them to view that aspect of the design. So it doesn't have to be a really strong, I mean, it should be a strong aspect of a sleeve or large scale design, but it doesn't really require like proper congruency or tie into it. It can be something that is more personal, profound. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with the tattoo aspects on the outside of the body that are more projected outwards that people can see just at you know, any angle when you're just walking around. This can be something that's more personal. If it is more personal, just see how they want to show it to people, right? If you're doing the design they want, whatever. I'll, I'll just use the traditional rose for everything with this because it seems to be the easiest way of doing things. You don't just put a rose dead center, right? Because what's going to happen? We're going to get this weird oblonging where it's going to pull together and pull out. Not like that. It's not going to look like junk. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and it's going to become distorted. But if our shapes are like this, we know what the person is going to be raising their arm to do this. You sure as heck can't put something here and know where to stick your leaves, right? If you got a leaf here and a leaf there, and the fucking, it'll sit a little bit easier on the arm. You wouldn't just like move it up, try to get that compressive spot there, and stick something out on the top that you know is just going to end up wobbling and drawing someone's eye to whatever you're seeing and showing that distortion more than well, it probably needs to be seen. Um. Back of the arm, front of the arm, just go top of bicep or just the tricep in total. They're gonna see the most, you know, distortion, but they're also the thinnest aspects of the body. And I think a lot of people move away from them, right? Because what you're trying to do is just create on this tight cylinder. What we try to do is focus on the inside and the outside to make sure that we've got like our focal point right on each side. Let's do this the front, this is the back. And all we try to do is just create movement going through, right? To lead someone around to the other parts that they just have something to look at. We don't have to do that, right? And we know on the back, we've got our, our tricep line that's gonna be a little bit weird. And on the front, we've got literally a line right through the center, but we're gonna have very strong compressive forces like this. They're gonna come out. Your topography on this, right? Very important. Center point is gonna be really strong. It's gonna be right in someone's face. That's right in front of it, right? Some people, depending on how built they are, it's the furthest part forward on their body, right? Even more than their chest sometimes, just depending on where they're standing. And the back as well, we're gonna have this huge recess for people who especially who have a really strong definition, where the spot underneath that, that horseshoe shape of the triceps is actually gonna be really far back. This is gonna be like deep, we'll just put deep, right? 
So if we're putting a focal point on the back of the body, we're trying to use some type of transitional element that isn't organic, that's actually fixed, especially like above like where the elbow line is, right? And it's far back, it's not gonna make sense to the viewer. They're gonna have to try to like n navigate and negotiate that topography to make things make sense. Same with here, you wouldn't make this the deepest part of the tattoo, right? It shouldn't be in the background. This shouldn't be in the foreground. So think about that when you're doing this, right? When you're doing that actual mapping and you're thinking about the design, if you're taking these things into account while you're making it, you don't have to guess where it's gonna lay. You don't have to try and, this is where it should belong. You'll know where it belongs because you've literally created the design for the person, right? So that's upper arm done for right now. I gotta go do a consult, so. I'll leave you. Anyways, this is Ryan from Better Tattooing. Same. Thanks for watching. Hey, once again, check out our, our podcast, Two Dudes Talk Tattoos. It's me and Brian Matthew. Uh, he's a fucking rad artist. And like and subscribe on the channel. Let us know what you think. I should say that at the beginning, shouldn't I? Anyways, talk to y'all later.